Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hunter, I'm an alcoholic. Um, I have a sobriety date, which is August 24th of last year, so I just celebrated a year last month. Um, I have a sponsor. I'm not that great about calling him, but um, we have a solid relationship. I sponsor other guys. Still kind of new at that, kind of finding my way. Um, I might talk a little bit about that. And uh, I have two home groups, actually. I'm sick enough to need two home groups. Uh, one of them is this one. I usually at the Saturday meeting, the Tuesday is kind of hard for me to make most weeks. Um, and the other one is the 10 at Sobe, 10 p.m. So uh, I'm a very happy customer of Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, just I want to make that clear at the beginning in case I sort of forget to say it. I am. Um, now, having done these 12 steps, I've experienced a change inside myself that uh, in, in short order, like in a very relatively short period of time, um, has, has really changed my life uh, for the better. And it's not my first time at the 12-step rodeo. Like I've been sober before and then went back out. I, um, I got sober for the first time 21 years ago in a different fellowship. And... One of the things that happened for me was I was getting sober from uh, crystal meth, and I was in a program that was dedicated to that people recovering from that drug. And I, um, I kind of told myself that, you know, that I just had a problem with with that drug, with that drug you know, and that I didn't someday I would drink again like a gentleman. So after five years of sobriety, I convinced myself that I could do that. And I drank again, and that opened this whole doorway to, um, to a living hell that brought me here many years later, um, a couple of years ago. And uh, I had a, an eight-month attempt last year, and um, I think one of the things that happened during those eight months was like my life rapidly got a lot better. Things were great, you know. Even externally, things felt good, and and because things felt so good, I, I kind of like I got complacent, and I stopped doing all the actions that I had learned to do in the program that made me feel great in the first place. And um, what I've learned in in the process of going through all that is is like what they say that this this program is a daily reprieve contingent upon the maintenance of my spiritual condition. Every day, I have to kind of reset and take a few key actions that keep me spiritually fit, that keep me connected to myself, to God, and to other people. And by doing that, um, you know, one day at a time, the, the obsession to use and to drink has been lifted from me. And, and more than that, like, I've, I've found a, a degree of contentment and peace inside myself and in my life that, you know, I'm 50, 54 years old, and I would say for the previous 53 years, I never had this kind of peace, this kind of uh, contentment in my life. I always felt, um, you know, our, our book talks about the spiritual sickness that is at the, the heart of this disease, um, and that's the reason why a spiritual solution works. Like, what, why would a spiritual solution work if it wasn't a spiritual problem? Um, and what that, what that spiritual sickness looks like for me is, is kind of feeling completely disconnected from everything that's important, um, disconnected from... Uh, my my true self I disconnect I, I, I don't like myself I, I don't even know myself I'm lying to myself about what's going on in my life um, and disconnected from God which is maybe the most important thing and disconnected from all of you I I grew up like you know like a lot of people talk about feeling completely alienated different from you. Uh, better than you or less than you, like never walking into any room and feeling uh, equal to you, but always, you know, looking for an advantage or feeling inferior. And um, from a very young age, like one of the things I've kind of come to see in, in, in sobriety this time is like that spiritual sickness and that sense of um, 
self-pity and self-centered fear and resentment and isolation that that sort of the expressed my sickness like that was with me years before I picked up my first drink or drug um, like those things weren't an outcome of drinking and drugging drinking and drugging were my temporary solution to make those feelings sort of go into the background and when I took a drink or a drug like I felt fine for a little while I didn't I felt connected to myself even if that was kind of an illusion um, I felt connected to you, even if that was also an illusion, and I felt connected to God, even if that was also an illusion. Um, it, it gave me that feeling of comfort and ease that um, that made all those feelings of, of like suffering and anguish and struggle that I was all wrapped up in, like those feelings were my whole life, uh, made that go away. And so why would I not compulsively use it? Um, and I don't think that those feelings of like you know, feeling separate and isolated and different and alone and, and um, all those other things like full of self-pity and fear and resentment and everything. I don't think those feelings are anything unique to us as alcoholics. Like every adolescent goes through those feelings. But I think one of the things that kind of is different about us as alcoholics is that we medicate those feelings and we never grow out of them. And I think most most you know, so-called normal people, like they, they kind of grow out of it, and they get on with the rest of their lives. Um, but I, you know, because I was so caught up in that sickness, I, I became ruled by my character defects, and I didn't know any other way of life. Like that was my only way of coping with things was to um, wallow in fear and, and self-pity and resentment and um, lash out in anger. And, indulge in you know, lust and, and um, greed and jealousy and gluttony and all the other character defects. And that was a really, um, it was a miserable way to live and it, it, it haunted me for most of my life until I got here. Um, do you ever want to, do you ever want to read my life story? It's on page 52 of the big book. There's this paragraph in the middle of the page that uh, people sometimes call the bedevilments. And the bedevilments are kind of like the opposite of the promises. We were having trouble with personal relationships. We couldn't control our emotional natures. We were a prey to misery and depression. We couldn't make a living. We had a feeling of uselessness. We were full of fear. We were unhappy. We couldn't seem to be of help to other people. That's kind of like my resume before I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. And, um, and then something happened you know, when I got here. I, I, and to tell you the truth, like I, I've always, my whole life, I've been looking for a spiritual solution to that sickness. Um, I've been casting around, trying out different spiritual paths, looking for something that would, that would make that feel better. And things would kind of click for a little while and then it wouldn't work anymore. And, and I come to realize in sobriety that like one of the reasons nothing worked, even though I was pursuing my spiritual life very kind of um, almost alcoholically, like really going gung ho into it, um, was because I wasn't sober and I wasn't right on the inside. And, and now that I'm kind of like getting right on the inside, a lot of the things that I studied and I practiced on those spiritual paths like earlier in my life, it's finally kind of like, feels like it's starting to turn into experience instead of just a bunch of ideas in my head. So what, what happens in these 12 steps is, and then I'm gonna talk more about a six, is like, I think of them like a recipe. Like if you want a German chocolate cake, there's a recipe to get German chocolate cake. If you follow that recipe, you get a German chocolate cake. Um, it can't fail. Like It doesn't matter what you think about German chocolate cake or if you believe the recipe is going to work or um, what your feelings about it are. If you follow those steps, that's the result. And um, if you don't follow those steps, like you'll get something else. It, it, you know, it might come out being edible, but it won't be German chocolate cake. It's like we come in here and we're suffering and we see this promise of like, you know, getting some of the same relief that we see other people experiencing. We hear them say that they were just like us 
a year ago or 10 years ago or whatever, and they tell us there's this recipe to get the same kind of cake that they're enjoying. And so we, we kind of like decide to trust that if I follow these steps, I'm going to get that cake. Um, and so that's a spiritual solution to a spiritual problem. We go through these 12 steps and we get the cake, which is spiritual awakening. Because these steps do something to us on the inside. They transform us. Um, they change our personality and our, they reconnect us to those things that I was talking about being disconnected from, our inner true self, our deeper self, uh, our, our, under, our own understanding of a higher power, of God, and other people. With those three fundamental forms of disconnection that kind of characterize my active addiction and my spiritual sickness, now I feel reconnected on all of those levels. So in steps one, two, and three, um, we kind of discover, in one we discover honesty, right? Like we finally get honest with ourselves, like this is not working. My whole life has become really messed up. Um, you know, the most obvious part of that is like, I'm, I'm really struggling with active alcoholism or whatever form of addiction, and, and my life is a mess. And, you know, we come to discover in time as we stay sober and we keep working the program that like, it's not just a mess on that level, like our whole life is unmanageable. Um, and so in, in steps one, two, and three, you know, starting with that honesty and then developing a sense of open-mindedness to the idea that there's something bigger than me that can help me uh, straighten my life out and, and restore me to some form of sanity. That's step two. And then in step three, um, I, m I make this decision to turn my, my life and my will over to the care of the higher power of my own understanding. So that's willingness. So in steps one, two, and three, we kind of start with honesty, and then we start to develop open-mindedness, and then the sense of willingness to actually go through with this. Um, and that's as far as a lot of people ever go. Like, you, call, you might hear about this one, two, three shuffle that happens a lot in the program, which is like you, you come in and you go through one, two, and three, and you're feeling great, and you're starting to develop all these nice ideas about life and God and, and everything, and then, you know, Step four is placed in front of you and shit starts to get real. Like you have to look at yourself and you have to sit down with paper and pen and do some homework and uh, a lot of people just don't want to do that. So um, in the short time I've been sponsoring guys this time, I've seen several of them you know, get up to the doorstep of step four and then quit, go back out. Or you know, in my own experience, like I stalled out on step four last time. I I didn't think I was afraid of doing it, but I sat on the beginning of it for months, and then I drank again. And then, you know, in five, we, we get honest again with ourselves, with another person, and with God about all the stuff we discovered in, in step four, which is like, it's an, an, an inner house cleaning. Like we look inside ourselves, and we discover, like, all the things that have been blocking our connection to, to God, to ourselves, and to other people. Uh, which is a spiritual sickness. We, we see all the ways that that expresses itself in us, um, which is different for each of us. And it's funny, we, um, you know, we say, in, it says in the book somewhere that like, this is not, alcoholism is not a moral failing, but then we talk about, you know, searching for this moral inventory, we talk about moral psychology, we talk about the seven deadly sins, and like, there's a lot of talk about moral stuff for something that's not a, a moral failing. Um, I think it's funny sometimes how the program can contradict itself, and that's the kind of thing that I used to, um, that would cause resistance in me, like seeing a, a paradox or a contradiction, I would be like, ah, it's contradicting itself, and I would throw up resistance towards it. Now I just embrace paradox, I embrace contradiction. And then we get to um, to six, and, and I can't really talk about six without talking about seven because they're kind of like they're almost inseparable in my mind. Um, but if you, I think, if you really want to boil down six and seven to their most essential essence, it's let go and let God. Like step six is let go, let go of your of, of the crap that you've discovered within yourself that is actually blocking your connection to yourself, to God, and to other people the character defects that have been making your life miserable. And then in step seven, let God, let God remove those things. 
ask and, and humbly ask and, and turn it over. And then, you know, having gone or having at least made a start on that work, then in steps eight and nine, we start to turn that same process outwards. So no longer just looking inwards and discovering all the stuff within ourselves that's blocking our connection, but looking outwards and discovering the ways we've hurt other people and damaged relationships in the world and, and starting to do that house cleaning on, up around ourselves in the rest of our lives. So repairing, so like one, two, one through three is like repairing my relationship to God. Um, steps four, five, six, seven is repairing my relationship to myself. Steps eight and nine is repairing my relationships to other people. So those three forms of disconnection that I mentioned several times already, like by going through these steps, we're slowly rebuilding those three forms of connection. And then 10, um, it's just kind of putting in place a, a sort of moral maintenance program so that on a daily basis, as other stuff comes up and, and we fall short of our ideals, we, we can um, we can stay on track. And 11, having done all that, like we, we now by this point, you know, we have a, we have some conscious contact with a higher power of our own understanding. And we seek to deepen that contact through prayer, through meditation, by having this direct um, experience of listening and talking to our higher power. And then in, in 12, we, we start to take the sense of purpose and usefulness and um, and direction that we discovered here and, and offer it to others, make it make ourselves useful and, and give back. So, you know, the, the big book, the big book kind of glosses over six and seven. Like it spends 40 pages talking about step one. And then on page 76, I think there's, there's two short paragraphs, not even long paragraphs. One for six and one for seven. And for a long time, that was the only official literature that existed about six and seven. It wasn't until 20 years later that they wrote um, the 12 and 12 and elaborated on each of the steps a little more. And it, it's funny because if you, if you, I've talked to a lot of people in this program that have like multiple years of sobriety and, you know, the people whose sobriety I really look up to and I want to emulate, I want that for myself. And um, those people usually say that like this whole program boils down to six and seven. Like, that's what that's the real meaning of this the crux on which the whole program turns. And yet, if you read the big books treatment of six and seven, like it almost feels like we kind of ran out of steam and they just brushed over six and seven really quickly. And you kind of like make this decision and you say a prayer and then you're done with it. And um, and I think that's one of the reasons why twenty years later. Bill and, and the rest of the folks in AA sat down and wrote the 12 and 12 and, and started to unpack this, each of the steps in more detail. And I think 6 and 7 is a good place where, where an example of where that was really necessary. Because um, it's, it's, it's about more than, you know, thoughts and, and making a prayer and then being done with it. Um, this is, like the, the reading said, it, it's a lifetime work, a lifetime's work. So... What happens if if we take that approach of like skipping over six and seven or brushing past it or just thinking it's a prayer and then you know saying that prayer once and being done with it? It's like um, you don't really change very much. Um, if you don't sort of work on a daily basis on turning over those character defects and letting them be removed. You're not really getting to the heart of the problem. Um, on page 73 of, of the reading in, in the, the part about step uh, step six or seven, it, it talks about how these defects of character are the very root of the problem that that led us to become active alcoholics in the first place. So, you know, not to like. This is not about anyone in particular. It's just a general observation. Like um, sometimes you see people in in the program who have been around for a long time, and um, they might have a lot of physical sobriety, but they're still suffering. They're still um, kind of the same jerks that they were before they got sober, and um, their lives are still unmanageable. 
and they're still road raging and getting fired from jobs and getting into conflicts all the time with people in the program and having affairs in their marriages and not getting along with their families and feeling resentful and bitter in their lives and, you know, basically being beholden to the bedevilments. Maybe not as dramatically as they were when they were actively drinking, but still, they're not happy, joyous, and free. Um, and I think one of the reasons why that happens is because they haven't really done out there at six and seven. Like they haven't become willing to let go of their character defects and have God remove them, haven't been willing to actually change. Um, so last week, we did uh, Tradition 5, and we talked about carrying the message to the alcoholic who still suffers. And when we, when we use that phrase, we usually mean the newcomer. But the newcomer is not the only alcoholic who's still suffering. Like sometimes it's people with time. Um, in the big book, you know, there's this whole section where we hear from Dr. Carl Jung. And Carl Jung was like one of the big time, uh, major sort of forefathers of modern psychology. He talks about, you know, the spiritual solution that we find in this program as huge emotional displacements and rearrangements, um, where ideas and attitudes, and which were once emotions, which were once the guiding forces of the lives of these men, are suddenly cast to one side, and a completely different set of conceptions and motives begins to dominate them. That's the kind of stuff we, we discover in six and seven. Like that's where the emotional displacement and the rearrangement of our personalities takes place. So, like in four and five, we started to see, and sometimes it's a really unpleasant process, we see the crap, the stuff inside the pipes that's blocking the pipes. And in six and seven, we start the process of like getting inside the pipes and clearing out all that gum was blocking our connection to God, to ourselves, to other people. Um, like the reading says, uh, get, starting to turn over all these things which we have admitted are objectionable. Um, it's an interesting word, like objectionable how? Like, objectionable because they blocked off this connection to ourselves, to God, to other people. Also objectionable because they are out of alignment with our own conscience, like it doesn't feel good to be living in a way that you know, we, feel, we know, we feel on the inside is not right. And objectionable because they kept us locked in the cycle of alcoholism and addiction. Because um, my character defects are the very things that might lead me to drink again. Like, when I get caught up in enough self-pity, or I get caught up in enough anger and resentment, or I get caught up in enough fear and anxiety and depression, I'm going to want to drink at it, eventually. Like, if I keep going in that direction. If I don't have the tools and if I don't apply them. So, you know, this process of like letting go of character defects and turning them over to God and having them removed, like the reading says, it's not something that, um, that happens overnight. It doesn't happen on our timeline necessarily. And it doesn't necessarily happen in, in the way we think it will or should. Um, like, I um, came out of my four-step thinking that my biggest character defect was pride. Um, since then, like, some other character defects that are actually much more problematic, you know, became obvious, and, and those are the ones that God decided to work on first. Um, when, I, uh, when I got sober last time, last year, I, um, my sponsor at the time, who was uh, Nicole L. She said, uh, God removes our character defects in the order in which they're killing us. She always used to say that. And I didn't really understand what she meant, but uh, we were always kind of, I was butting my head against a lot of stuff around sex and like letting my sex instinct run wild and, and being very promiscuous at the, at the time. And, um, and it was really causing me problems. And my life was feeling unmanageable as a result of it. And she kept telling me, like, you really need to look at this and be willing to turn it over and, and, and let God, you know, show you how to handle this. And, and I just, I refused to do it. And she said, you're probably going to drink over this. And I didn't believe her. And eventually I, I did. So, um, the difference between uh, then and now is like, 
you know, when I came into sobriety this time, I decided to, uh, that particular issue, I decided to turn it over and, and let it go and let God um, take control. So I, I came into sobriety this time and I put sex and dating and relationships on the shelf. And, um, you know, I de- the idea was like the first year, because everybody says it's the first year or whatever. Uh, I think it's more about like getting through this process of like, actually experiencing the change on the inside that the steps produce. And, um, and it's been a completely different experience. So when we get here, you know, the, um, the thing that's most obvious, the character defect that's most obviously killing us is our active alcoholism and addiction. So that's typically the one that got in this first and then goes in the order of the others that are killing us so that we can be restored to sanity step by step. Once that, once that monster is, is brought into submission, then we have a chance to actually start looking at our other kind of lesser character defects that are not killing us so dramatically. But we have to be willing to cooperate with this process. Like, uh, that's the we're entirely ready part. Uh, God helps those who help themselves. Like, God doesn't necessarily need our cooperation. Sometimes a, a character defect is removed by force, uh, whether we like it or not, but uh, it's nice if God has our cooperation in that process. There's less suffering involved for us if we cooperate. So, um, I like uh, on page 72, it, it talks about a definition of humility, which is the desire to seek and do God's will. Humbly ask God to remove our character defects. Just asking God, you know, humbly seeking to, to know and, and to do God's will. So by the time you get to step six, you already know the problem is you. Right? Like the problem is not other people. Um, the problem is not even necessarily the bottle or the drug. The problem is you. And this is your chance to actually start to change you. Start to get to the root of the problem and to, um, to be happy, joyous, and free. Like to not just to put down the, the bottle or the, the pipe or whatever it is and, and just be abstinent for the rest of your life and keep being the same miserable bastard, but like actually change and, and become happy, joyous, and free and live in the rest of your life the way that God wants you to live your life. Um, I mean, that's the kind of sobriety that I want. But how can I be happy, joyous, and free if I'm still holding on to the very things that made me miserable? So that's all I got. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.